Welcome to the Neil Wadier Podcast, where you'll hear real stories of resilience and discussions on how to enhance your mental strength. I am your resilience and mental performance coach, developing your skills to grow and thrive through stress and adversity, and propelling your mental performance from good to great. Listen on your favorite podcast hosting service, and please leave a rating and a review. Also, follow my content on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn, or visit neilwadier.com. And today I'm welcoming into the studio Jeremy Bowman, who is with Rise, is a Nebraska nonprofit that works with uh, individuals with a criminal background. Jeremy, thanks a lot for coming to the podcast. Studio. Oh, thanks for having me out. You bet. Appreciate it. Um, I'm not. I don't like going into a big long explanation because you're going to tell it better than I will. So give us an sure. explanation, a, a quick overview of uh, of your involvement with Rise and what you do with Rise. Sure. So I'm the CEO of Rise, and this organization has been around for about three years. We were a program of a national organization for about the first 18 months, and then we rebranded and created our own curriculum. And so we've officially been Rise for about 18 months. But similar work for about the last three years here in Nebraska, focused on pre-release reentry preparation for incarcerated individuals in our state. We do a six-month pre-release program that focuses on character development, job readiness, and entrepreneurship. And our graduates receive a certificate in workforce readiness from UNO's business school. We have case managers on that work with our program graduates to help them transition back to the community. So there's a lot of challenges people face when they're returning from prison. So we come alongside folks and help make sure that they have access to housing, mental health care, substance abuse, uh, you know, recovery needs, as well as uh, employment, which is a big, uh, is, it's a big struggle and challenge when people return back home. Right. So you go, you actually go into the, the, the prisons within Nebraska, and you work with the inmates, and then you also have a mentorship program after they're released to help them through the process. How did you originally get started in an organization like this? So I'll tell you a little bit about about my background. I grad, I'm from the East Coast, so I grew up in New York City and grew up in Queens. Was a pastor's kid in New York, and we lived in New York and New Jersey growing up. And after college, I started a company. I was an entrepreneur, and so we started a um, telecommunications business called New York Telecom. When a lot of people were getting dedicated internet access. We sold web hosting and dedicated internet connectivity solutions. And a kind of a long story short, three years into that business, our infrastructure was in the Five World Trade Center and was destroyed on September 11th. Our offices were two blocks south. And so that, uh, that uh, event had a real impact on my life and the trajectory of my vocation. So I, I left that organization to go and uh, work in the nonprofit, raising money for victims and families of the 9-11 disaster. So for the last 18, 19 years, I've been in leadership positions in higher education and nonprofit. And I worked at Creighton University for seven years prior to starting this organization in Nebraska. During that time, I volunteered at the Douglas County Jail. So I mentored people pre-release, pre-trial. So they were waiting to be sentenced, and they would either get released back to the community or they would go to prison. I noticed the some common themes uh, along the lines of resiliency, which I think is a great reason that we're talking. But um, working with people that are that have been incarcerated, they have a, they've felt, been through a lot of adversity from a young age. Uh, in their own lives, which is that adversity has led to a lot of resiliency and to gain skill sets out of necessity. And so I had by choice and early in my career decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Many people in the system have that choice kind of thrust upon them out of necessity to, you know, make a living for your family, to keep your, your family safe, to keep a roof over your head from a young age. So they have this resiliency. They have this entrepreneurial skill set and this hustle uh, often from a young age that when I was volunteering I saw there was just a real opportunity here to help folks that had this skill set use their entrepreneurship in a legal context to help them stay out of prison 
and if you get out and you have a felony background, it can be hard to get hired. If you have the ability to create your own job and you have some folks that come alongside you and help you do that, they have the resiliency to um, to start small businesses. So that was kind of the genesis of what is now RISE and the entrepreneurship component that we do is really that training and we do a Shark Tank style pitch competition in the state prisons with IOUs of funding to folks upon release to put towards that um, business creation and job creation uh, when they get home. And when you talk about going, so going into the the prison system and, and working with people, you're not talking about a basic mentorship program. The the way you explained it to me is this is a very long and and difficult and 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 very. Uh, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. There's a lot of accountability associated with it. If you want to be in the program, you got to keep your nose clean. You got to do all the right things. Um, there is a lot of accountability, and it is a long program. It's not just a simple mentorship program. Can you kind of give us an idea of what that looks like for when you go into the prisons and you work with people? What's that? Sure. What's the curriculum? What's the program look like? So the, that program we do in seven of the ten Nebraska state prisons, and the program takes usually six or seven months to complete. So participants are in a classroom three days a week, and they're they are doing about 15 to 20 hours a week of work on RISE. So over a longer period of time, they're building muscle memory. You're seeing real transformation occurring, and they're working really hard. And so it's a program that's more rigorous than just about anything else that's offered in prisons. And there's a lot of, you know, programming where you can go a couple weeks and get a certificate and you have a resume. Uh, but this, you know, the building blocks are, you know, character development. So they're working on some really challenging, you know, life skills, things like shame and accountability and forgiveness, how to make a meaningful apology and parenting and etiquette and networking. And then we use that as we call that part foundations. And then from there, they're doing job readiness. So we are doing things like resume and mock interviewing. and But we're also doing this entrepreneurship component. Uh, so about half the people that start the program graduate. And we accept 100% of those that apply to the program. We usually will lose you know, 10 or so right out of the gate because it, it's hard. And some folks might not be ready to make that type of commitment or they're too focused on their case or whatever the case may be. And then the facilities have a one strike rule. So if they have a certain level of misconduct report, they're removed from the program. And that's not our rule, that's the prison's rule. So the way that shakes out is we have about 50% that end up you know, putting on a cap and gown and graduating with this certificate from UNO. So it's you know, it, it's really challenging to folks, um, but there's a lot of people that really want a different life when they get out, and they're willing to do the work uh, to get and put themselves in that position. So if they get through the program, we're we're very pleased to be able to continue supporting them. They do a 20-page reentry plan in the program, which is more than they're offered from the system itself. And then we're helping them implement that reentry plan when they get out. So it's it's a true inside out solution that just otherwise doesn't exist. Right. So uh, two questions come up. Um, one is the the members that may uh, that might miss out and end up being dropped out uh, dropped out or removed from the program. What does it look like for potential reentry down the road? And then for you know you're talking about people in prison that might be for an, for an extended period of time what does it look like for them say between graduation of the program and their actual release which could be an extended period of time what does their involvement look like so, but start with the you know members that might be removed from the program what's it look like to kind of get them back on track later down the road so if you are removed from the program you can reapply and you have to start at the beginning again. So we have several people that just aren't ready and they end up being removed and they're, you know, they're still getting in some trouble. And they, through the program, realize that they messed up and they, you know, we're about second, third, fourth, you know, we're about as many chances. So we often have people that will start the program again and go through it and they'll graduate on the second, third, and in some cases, fourth try. 
you know, it's, it's harder that way because you're starting again. We have people that have literally done almost 18 months of programming just to complete the program. So we hang in there with people. We want them to be able to come back and, and get through it. And we lose a lot of people towards the end, we found, because there's such a fear of, of, of having something go well. And I, I had not anticipated that. That was a blind spot for me. But just that fear of success, that fear of, you know, this is usually where I self-sabotage and, you know, this is where things go wrong and I and I kind of make them go wrong. We've had to really build more into the program around, you know, getting a win and what that feels like and how once you do, you know, building some wins off of that and how that can really change the trajectory of your life. So we welcome them back. We put them through again. The people that have, you know, significantly more time to serve before they are released, we, we accept all people that apply. So we do have people that, have, that are on life sentences or they're on longer sentences. We typically will keep about 10 of our graduates involved as peer facilitators, and they're often on life for longer sentences. So they're facilitating small group discussions during the program. They are our best recruiters. They're great mentors. They often have really good credibility in the facilities. And, you know, in some facilities, I'll walk in and a lifer will hand me the agenda for the day and they're teaching a course and they'll say, you got 10 minutes, Jeremy, on this because we're teaching X, Y, and Z. So they own the program and their life has worth and value if they're potentially not getting out because we're a life without parole con uh, state here in Nebraska. They have an opportunity to give back and help others release. And that really gives them a lot of purpose. We do, between our six-month courses, we gather all of our graduates for some continuing education, and so that's an opportunity for us to see those that might still have a little bit more time left and bring in some programming for them, catch up on where they are in their reentry process. And then in the community, we have a alumni association where we're convening our graduates on a monthly basis so that they have just a healthy community to come back to. A lot of times when people come home, they are going back to a situation that might have led to their incarceration, some type of unhealthy community, family issue, gangs. So we're trying to build a healthy reentry community of others who are on this journey and trying to do better so that they can support one another. And that's kind of a beautiful community that's forming out of those that are coming back to the community from the program. So when you have the, the, you talk about the community and people being able to get involved, is there like levels where, where people can almost continue to graduate into, you know, being a, uh, not just a member of the community, but also being a mentor to further, further their involvement in, in the program down the road? Yeah, we just launched a mentoring program for post-release. And one of the unique aspects of our program is, our ability to bring the community into the facilities. So in, in three years, we bought 600 volunteers into the prison facilities in Nebraska. And so we'll bring in 30 to 50 volunteers for a coaching day where they come in and they review resumes. We do some empathy building exercises. They do mock interviewing. They listen to our participants talk about you know their personal statements so how you would talk about your incarceration in a job interview that will put you in the best position to be successful. And that does a couple of things. One, it prepares our, we call our participants builders. That's a term we use for our participants. It prepares our builders um, to be better prepared for employment and for release, but it also prepares the community and humanizes people who are incarcerated. So now that you have some context and a name and a story around somebody's life, you're more likely to want to help that person or make a phone call on their behalf or think about your hiring policies at your business. So by bringing the community into the facilities, it's creating a bridge back to the community for people coming out of incarceration. So that's the in-prison volunteer aspect that we have, but we've started working with our existing volunteers to create a mentoring program where if you think about you know, mentoring programs in Nebraska, like teammates or, you know, boys and girls club, things where you're paired with, 
you know, big brothers, big sisters. We're doing that for reentry, and we have opportunities for people in the community to come alongside a reentering citizen and help them navigate that reentry. Then they partner with our case manager, but they're there for more, um, you know, kind of accountability and moral and emotional support. Just having somebody else in your corner on kind of your reentry team. When people reenter, they're in crisis, and so most people will reoffend within the first ninety days of release. If you have substance abuse issue, you'll usually use substances within the first seventy-two hours. So, how do we? how do we triage that crisis that first 90 days and help people get over the hump? So one of the things is this mentoring project where we have community volunteers that are mentoring and committing to six months and they meet with their mentee, you know, once, once a week or at least once a month, but they're communicating on a weekly basis. We're having our, we're having some of our graduates of our program that are released going through this to become mentors. And the thought is if you've returned and you're mentored and you get through that six months, we want to begin training those mentees to then become mentors because nobody understands reentry like somebody who actually went through it themselves. They have that lived experience. And it's an opportunity for them to pay that back and pave the way for somebody who's following behind them, you know, from incarceration. And you and I have had that conversation before because being a veteran, I I, I can identify with that mentality of not everybody understands what I went through. And when you when you when you have veterans or military members, you know, I don't need to necessarily have been the same branch of service or do the same job or have the experiences but the fact that I'm a veteran, there, there's some kind of connection there. So I can understand how that would be real important to have people connect with somebody who has been through the struggle and can identify and maybe right. em- empathize a little bit closer mm-hmm. with them. Who's been some of your um, your, your bigger partners? Because you talk about a curriculum. Who, who helped put this together and who's been your real supporters putting this program together? So we're a nonprofit and we're privately funded. So we have no state or federal money. We have a little over a million dollar budget that as a CEO, I have the joy of raising every year. (laughs) Uh, We have 15 staff members now, uh, five of which are graduates of our program. They're returning citizens who are um, serving in significant roles in the organization as reentry specialists, volunteer manager, um, office support. And so that's been really helpful to inform our work. Just like you're talking about people that have that lived experience and perspective, we we now have that um, in a significant way on our, you know, on our actual, on our staff. The other supporters, you know, we spent 10 months working with a education partner, which was actually retired former military and some Creighton University professors who helped us really focus on the learning outcomes we were trying to achieve with our curriculum. So our staff wrote a lot of our curriculum, but we did have an education partner that really kind of helped us think through um, as an academic curriculum would, you know, would be kind of structured. And then we really relied heavily upon graduates of the program to inform the curriculum. So we really wanted to know what's landing and what's not. What would what do they wish would have been included? So people with lived experience, both incarcerated and in the community, you know, continue to really inform what we're bringing Thank in. Thank you for listening to the Neil so Water Podcast. Not, Please you know, leave a rating and a review to help from spread our resilient stories education and help others develop their mental we're skills. We're helping it. Follow me on really Facebook. The Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. What somebody with For more the information about my coaching and development services, and visit neilwadier.com. Let to me help really you lower develop your skills to grow and thrive through stress and adversity and, out. and propel your mental performance right. for good to And that's real exciting. Because so, not only are you doing the work, you're helping people, you're, you're walking and like, bringing people into your, into your own organization. You're not just trying to send them out into the community and to other businesses. You have people that are graduates of the program that are mentors working in your organization. Um, what's what's that been like? I mean, because that's 
you, you know, when you when you first do something like that, there's got to be a little trepidation and a little a little bit of, you know, is this really going to work out? Um, what's that transition been like? And what's the feeling now moving forward? We've learned a lot. And it's been a front row seat to really seeing how challenging it is to come back from incarceration. And we and we see that first half with those staff that we've hired who have who have experienced that. We've you know we have staff that have really struggled to find places to live. Um, before we hired them, they had been offered positions at other organizations, and then they get hired and they start only to have somebody at the organization come and say, "Actually, we ran a background check, and we're not going to hire you now." And that kind of you know that that kind of you know routine is happening time and time again with our folks who come back but it's challenging you you know you have very quick finances that need to be figured out you're trying to get identification so you can get a job but often your identification is you know might have fees and fines levied against it that you need to figure out transportation is a barrier you can't get a car without money if you don't have a job, you know, but if you can't get to your job, you can't work. So there's just so many things that are wrapped up that that pose these challenges. And we did have one of our release graduates that worked for us for a while end up going back to prison and he had relapsed. Um, and so we got to see that close up, just how in society if people with substance abuse issues relapse, there's opportunities often to recover or to try to get it back up on your feet very quickly. If you're on parole, that's not an option. You relapse, you're going back to prison, which is counterproductive and sends you back upstream and creates even more challenges and more hopelessness because you, you don't have the ability to bounce back. You're back in you're back incarcerated. So it's it's really informed us in having a better understanding and to be equipped to come alongside our returning builders when we have folks who are in real time navigating that on their own and we're we're watching and seeing you know just how challenging that can be and there's custody issues oftentimes with children Um, there's relationships that were severed that they're trying to rebuild Uh, the community constantly uh, has a judgment uh, towards you based on that felony. I'm grateful I don't have to get up every day and kind of navigate my way through the world thinking about the worst things I've ever done. And that's really what's happening for people coming out of incarceration is they can never, you know, people are complex and there's so much more to all of us, yet we're defining people for a really bad moment. People that have often had serious trauma in their own lives and that's been something that we've unpacked as well, just that most people who commit crimes have been victims of crimes in their own lives, often from people that are supposed to love them and care for them and people in their own life at a very young age. And so those are um, all things that we knew, but kind of seeing it up close, um, it's just uh, it's it's really hard to get traction. Yeah. You know, and that's... It's it's difficult because you're right. It's it's easy to judge. It's easy to try to push people back into the system and just say you're a problem. Um, you know, in the military, I've worked in positions where I've been part of the transition where you know, say somebody's in trouble and we have to separate them from the military. And a lot of people have that mentality of you know, just get them out the gate and they're no longer a problem. But there's the problem with that mentality is they still are your problem. They are now out in society with no support, or maybe they've lost their benefits. And now not only do they have the stigma, they have the loss of self-esteem, but they have the loss of benefits. And now they have to go make their way in an unsupported environment. And so I've always, I've tried to take the mentality of even in the situations where 
Maybe I have to separate someone from the military. They're still a person. They still need to be a productive member of society. And it's my job to make sure that they have that transition plan, that there's something that, you know, they, they can hook up with whatever the remaining benefits, if they've lost some, what, what can they do? Because if you allow people that type of mentality of what can you do, that's an empowerment focus rather than here's all the problems that you cause and this is why you're a burden to us. And it's just, it's, I don't know, it, it's difficult to to try to find a, a balance between holding people accountable and trying to support them and provide for, especially in the instance where you talk about, and you probably see a lot where you might have repeat offenders or you have mm-hmm. people that have failed numerous times and you still want to encourage them, but you still have to have the accountability. That's got to be a real difficult balancing act. It's challenging. And you know, some of the statistics around this, nationally, three out of four people that come home from prison will go back within five years. So 76%. We do a little better in Nebraska. It's one in three. So about 34% of people that get out will go back to prison. And, you know, 89% of people that reoffend don't have a job at the time they reoffend. So often there's hopelessness that sets in, or you're going back to illegal means to provide. And then that leads to incarceration. So there's, you know, Nebraska is in this unique space where we're the second most overcrowded prison system in the country. So our prisons are at 170% of capacity here. They're understaffed, which means that there's less programming. And that leads to hopelessness and not enough programming to help people reenter and do well. What we're trying to get the community to understand is that 95% of people in prison are coming home, just like you're talking about people who might be, you know, discharged and coming back to communities. If you're if you're serious about public safety, and, and we all are, helping people reenter well and preparing them to do so improves public safety. It lowers the likelihood of recidivism. When 70% of kids follow in their parents' footsteps into prison, it keeps parents out in the community working, parenting, stopping that cycle of generational incarceration. A lot of good things happen. And if you're not as focused on the social justice aspects of it, it's really expensive to incarcerate people in our in our country. So in Nebraska, it costs $36,000 a year to incarcerate one person for one year. And for a youth, it costs about 90000 So for, for the community to understand, as taxpayers, they're paying for this. They're paying for the second most overcrowded system in the country. And if people are recidivating, it means that public safety is not what it should be. They're, you know, It's a win-win if we collectively care about this issue and give people second chances with housing, with jobs, um, with loans, with all of the things that we all need to navigate and have fulfilling, successful lives, if we take those things away from returning citizens, it's going to continue to hurt the community as a whole, and it hurts everybody. Right, and that's, I guess that's you know that's the mentality that you have to take is yeah, you know, yeah, a large percentage of people eventually are going to be leaving. So what are we doing to enable and empower them to help that transition so that they're not just going back to old habits? Yeah. Um, where do you see? Um, you know, we talk a lot about the strengths and a lot, a lot of great things that are going to the problems. What are some of the struggles that you have in that you're, you're trying to address or that? you know, if people say that they, you know, maybe can help, what are some of the struggles that you're having, that you're having that people might be able to help or provide some type of service? Employment's really the key. It's not a silver bullet, but it's as close we can get to something very tangible that allows somebody to be able to, you know, keep from going back to illegal means to make money. And if you get out and there's more and more time passing before somebody's willing to take a chance and hire you. You can't pay for, you know, you have to pay $153 a month for your ankle monitor. You have to pay for that tra- transitional halfway house that you're living in. Um, it's likely that, you know, child support, you're starting to have to pay those types of things again. So when the community can offer opportunities to returning citizens, 
you're going to get a hard worker that needs that opportunity. And when we have unemployment as low as it is in Nebraska, where it's at 3%, and companies are thinking about leaving the state because they can't meet their workforce needs, these two things can't be mutually exclusive. We have people ready to work, but because of that felony background, they're ostracized, yet we have all of these jobs that we need folks to step into so that these companies can be successful. So hiring and giving that second chance is such a key part of it. And we've done that pretty well. So we have over 400 people now that have graduated our in-prison program. About 100 of those are back in the community. 90% are employed. And that's because of the community coming in and getting a sense of you know, what our program's about. And if you're going to take a risk hiring somebody with a felony background, we're telling you we have a case manager that's going to come alongside that individual. There's kind of a reentry support team that your company can access because we want that person to be successful. And we built trust in a relationship with that individual that they don't want to let us down, you know, and they want other people that are getting out after them to be able to pipeline into that company too. So they feel that sense of loyalty to us, but also that sense of I'm, I need to do this well for myself, but also because there could be more jobs here in the future for other people coming out of incarceration. Um, substance abuse is a big problem. People that have violated parole that have graduated our program and went, and went back to a person that's been related to substance abuse, and that can be hard to watch. I think we all experience that where we have loved ones that, you know, just struggle with that issue. And that's so closely tied to mental health, where 75% and up of our participants have diagnosed mental health issues, where we criminalize mental health now and we incarcerate people instead of providing treatment and, and support. So if the community can, you know, provide second chances um, come in with a program like RISE to meet people who are in the system and learn how much you're alike with them, like how much you have in common. It's likely that there's things that, you know, I know I have privilege in my life where there's differences in my experience, but I also know that there's so much that I do have in common with the brothers and sisters we work with that are incarcerated. And that leads to, I think, empathy, and that empathy leads to opportunity. And so having the community engage with the issue and seeing that there's value and benefit if we all engage with this, where public safety will improve and we'll fill jobs we need to fill. And your taxes, you know, your your money you're paying for incarceration will go down. It's It's a win-win for everybody if we can all look at this issue together. Yeah, I think this is a, a a really amazing program, and I've I've been interested in in some way, some some form or fashion of of getting into the the, the prison. And I know that, you know that sounds so absurd, but I've had this thought in my mind for a long time. And I was I was down in Tucson. Uh, I was stationed in Tucson at Davis Mothin Air Force Base for a, a while, and I had I was working with an organization down there trying to get in. And for whatever reason, it didn't work out. And so I, I switched over and I worked with another organization it was, you know, something similar where we were doing outreach to underage uh, homeless, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, teens, basically uh, homeless teens, uh, because that's a unique perspective because down there they still have truancy, which, you know, so you're not going to school. There's one strike and then a lot of them have dogs as companions or protection and then they're unlicensed so you know if you get caught then automatically you've got two strikes and right. they don't have a lot of sympathy for you and then a lot of them are runaways for either abuse or, or or drugs or you know some type of mental health like there's so many significant issues that people don't take into account and for whatever reason i got latched onto this idea mm -hmm. that i wanted to take my my empathy and my willingness, and and I actually had one of my my former um, pastors who had moved on to a to a new to a place, was he kept giving me 
a hard time about this. And he's like, you know, there's special place for people like you that want so badly, like you're, you're hunting for an opportunity to go into prisons and work with people. Right. It's like, I don't understand yeah. what your passion is. And so that's why it was so exciting when I hooked up with you. And, you know, from the get go, I've been just real excited about when can we go? When can we go? When yeah. you go? And you're like, okay, bring it down. Like there's a process and we got to go through. Yeah. Um, so it's been fun having that conversation, but at least letting you know, how serious I am about yeah. being involved. Um, so you and I have talked about um, the the meetup. So like just the other day, you had sent me um, a message. So they do, um, and this is, I believe, the, the meetups with like the mentorship program. These are our alumni association meetups. So they're graduates who are released that we get together every month for food and fellowship and some kind of continuing education. Right. And so that's where you and I had talked about. Maybe that's a good place to start meet some people yeah. in the organization, meet some people that have gone through the program, hear their story, provide some of the skills that I teach as far as resilience and mental performance to them um, and, and start building that relationship and then eventually get to the place where, um, you know, what I offer fits into the program and then actually going in into yeah. the prisons. And I think that makes sense. Um, and just having that conversation has been real exciting for me because yeah. I, honestly, I can't, I can't tell you when it started, but I've always had this drive where I've wanted to take um, my passion for working with people and trying to build people up. Um, cause I've had that mentality for a long time that, you know, I've, I've a, a person that I work with, he uses the phrase over and over again, that a rising tide raises all ships. Yeah. And I've had that mentality for a long time that you build people up, you know, you go out and you've got a skill. Great. Find a way to either you get a job doing that, volunteer doing that, help other people doing it. Um, because you, your skills are valuable to other people. So I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to come in. Um, what, what do you do, um, as far as, um, like community, um, engagement, do you do, um, you know, you, you talked about your alumni association. I know that you mm -hmm. also get together on, um, occasional Fridays at one of the coffee shops, yeah. uh, downtown. Um, what other type of community engagements where you just try to just start conversation and invite people in to ha start having these sure. conversations? Uh, you know, people, that want to get involved it's not as simple as some other volunteer opportunities where you know you kind of show up and you serve a meal um you know people have questions they want to know is it safe and the answer to that is yes it's safe um they just want to try to wrap their head around it if they've never been in facilities and kind of what the expectation is and so there's a lot of education that goes on the front end because we have to let facilities know 30 days in advance, like our final list of who's going to come to an event in facilities. People need to do a background form with state corrections and there's some training. So we try to, you know, really go to different community, you know, we talk to a lot of civic groups and churches and businesses I'll be speaking next week, like for the State Human Resources Association, talking to HR professionals about second chance hiring. We try to educate local businesses about some of the federal incentives that are available from the government for second chance hiring. There's, there's a federal bonding program where you can take out bonds and not have to pay for them if you're worried about, you know, some type of issue happening with equipment if you hire somebody that's coming out of prison. There's tax credits. There's uh, another program where you get paid a stipend and then training if there's a particular skill that they're going to be accessing. So we try to educate companies about some of those kind of practical things. And, you know, with 600 people that have now come in, we have a really good recidivism rate of people that come back. So over half of our volunteers have come in you know, at least once or twice, and they come back for many different types of events. And they become really vocal supporters of the work we're doing. So we're, we're speaking at things. I'm looking at my week now, and I'll speak probably four or five times this week at different for different groups. And just constantly trying to educate and, you know, whether it's speaking to college students about why this issue is important or faith communities around what faith in action could look like in grace and mercy or you know businesses around why this could be an untapped 
creative way for them to meet workforce needs. We're really trying to, even down to what we're doing in, in the legislature where we have a staff member who's lobbying on behalf of RISE around criminal justice reform, where, you know, there's conversation about a new prison where, you know, we're opposed to things like that, but we're in favor of different types of things that will make it easier for people to reenter and get back up on their feet. So we're really trying to have a public conversation in as many different avenues as we can. Nice. One of the things that we hear a lot about now is the 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 open jobs, the the inability to fill in the trades. Has there any been kind of like a partnership where there's been a push into hands on? Um, you know, going into apprenticeship programs or, or hands-on um, uh, training for, uh, the, you know, the trades? We partner really well with Metropolitan Community College here in town, and they have opportunities for you to get some of the trades uh, training pre-release. So an example would be we, we run our program at the Omaha Correctional Center. They have a driving simulator there where you can get a Class A CDL license before you get out. They have OSHA certifications. There's a welding program. Uh, we've partnered with the Chamber of Commerce and their REACH program around trades programming. So we're doing more of the character development and soft skills and employment readiness and then partnering with some of the groups that are doing um, opportunities for getting the licensing and certifications necessary to go into the trades. It's ultimately still comes down to employers being willing to give those opportunities, those apprenticeships. So we're focusing in a few areas where we think there's, you know, H3, they call it high needs, high skill, high wage. Things like driving, where you have trucking companies in the Midwest who just can't, you know, get get enough people to work and, and drive. And those are li living wage jobs. Computer programming, where we're starting to do some computer programming work in the women's facility that we serve so that there's some, you know, computer programming job opportunities. That's a, you know, a, a livable wage job. Um, apprenticeships around electri electricians or HVAC or plumbing. Those are really high demand livable wage jobs. So it's trying to find pipelines into historically underutilized or represented options for people coming out of prison and saying, hey, let's figure this out because we just have such a gap in service, yet we can't get people who are motivated and have the ability to do these jobs into these jobs. And some of that's legislation. It's, um, it's, re it's taking away barriers to licensing and credentialing. And some of it's just changing the stigma around reentry. And some of it's just having companies, you know, willing to take a leap of faith and try it out. And we think we're a good partner in those situations because we're sending you somebody that we've been very thoughtful about fit to fit to role and fit to organization. We know that they've gotten the training that they need. And if they stumble, it's likely we're going to be there and have some window into the challenges that they're facing and can help pick them back up very quickly. So those are some of the things I think about in terms of that employment gap. Um, it, and a lot of it just comes down to the willingness of the private sector to, you know, the, the companies that get it are getting really hard workers that'll go through a wall for them and they'll be loyal. And those are the companies that tell us, hey, we love the RISE graduate you sent us, send us more RISE graduates. We nice. just need more companies that do that. Good. Yeah, just take the leave of faith, right? True. And um, so then the, the, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is, you know, nonprofit, they make their money off of, you know, a lot of uh, donations. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you, you talked about you don't necessarily get money from the state. Who do you or how do you network that? And then how can other people become more involved if, you know, I mean, because you can say, well, I, I can't really, I don't, I don't really have a lot of need for people, but I can always use money, right? Right. And sometimes it's an uncomfortable conversation, but you're a nonprofit and you have to have that. So what is your, what is your mode? What's your method? How do you network? And then how can people donate yeah. if they feel they want to? Yeah, we, you know, 
we work with some local foundations that really understand what we're trying to do. And so they've invested in, in our work. We have some corporate partners that invest in what we do. And then a lot of our volunteers end up becoming annual donors because they've seen firsthand the change that happens in people's lives. We are a very cost-effective solution for a very expensive problem. So when you think about, you know, it costs a thousand dollars for us to put somebody through our pre-release program. When you look at our staffing and our curriculum and everything that we do, and it costs thirty-six thousand dollars to incarcerate that same individual, and we're able to have a higher likelihood of that person not recidivating. Recidivating that social return on investment is very high, and so you know we talk. We have folks that do scholarships for people to be able to participate in the program or just support the operations of the organization. Um, but that social return on investment, we have found companies and foundations really like that, and we're able to show lower recidivism than the state has, higher employment than, you know, than the regular trends are. And, you know, we need to be able to do more of that. So we'd love your support. If this is something that has touched you in any way, you can go to our website is uh, www.seeusrise, S-E-E-U-S-R-I-S-E dot org and slash get involved. That's where you can learn about volunteering or donate to our organization online. And so we'd love to have you check out the website, learn more about what we do and engage in us that way. And we're on all the socials. CS Rise underscore um, is our handle for Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Nice. And I follow on uh, on Facebook, and I, I, I see a lot of the stuff that you're doing. It's amazing. I love it, and I'm looking forward to getting more involved. Um, we're going to continue to have that conversation, and, and I'm in. Um, I love this, and and um, been to the the offices, the beautiful yeah. office building at the the, the Peter Kiewit, um facility. Right at the Kiewit, yeah. And um, I've uh, been up to your offices, um, you know, a great crew. Um, looking forward to coming out and having coffee and then, uh, you know, come out and, and, and engage, uh, not just speak, but actually engage with people and, and find out, you know, what are their stories? Um, and I'm sure that, uh, they're going to have just as much of an impact on me as I will on them. It, yeah. Probably more so. Um, cause I, I just would imagine that's, if you come in open-minded, that's just what's going to happen when you, when you see the, the work that's being done with and through people, uh, to help other people. Uh, with with the right mindset is is always a beautiful thing. So yeah, um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I'm really excited. Uh, all the information is going to be in the show notes, and um, yeah, I'm just I'm just so excited uh, to get involved in this. I've been trying to um, to do something like this for a long time, and I'm very passionate about it. I'm very excited. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks for coming out and sharing your story. Thank you, and thanks for putting me and some of my team through your resilience training. It's been very helpful, and we just see how valuable that could be to people that face these barriers they do upon release so we're grateful for you and for your willingness to share your gifts and your expertise around resilience uh, with our population so thank you so much neil thank you for listening to the neil water podcast please leave a rating and a review to help spread our resilient stories and help others develop their mental skills follow me on facebook Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. For more information about my coaching and development services, visit neilwadier.com. Let me help you develop your skills to grow and thrive through stress and adversity and propel your mental performance from good to great.